Good morning. Welcome to our annual 9 a.m. service. <laughs> this is usually the day when the lead pastor does not preach, <laughs> youth pastor preaching day. But we don't have a youth pastor, so it's me. <laughs> if you're new here among us, I don't think so. My, <laughs> my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor, and I wonder if anyone here is like me and you've ever been in maybe a group situation where someone says a phrase that you've never heard before. Never? No? Okay. Well, I'll continue. You've never heard this phrase before. You have a couple of options. Let's say it's a funny phrase. Well, one option is you can just pretend that you know the phrase, right? And do the awkward laugh. <laughs> and hope that maybe there'll be a context you can figure it out and hope that nobody questions you, right? Like, don't you understand that? And now you're like, uh. Or you can just do what I do because I'm getting older. I don't care anymore. I'll just say, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? So this happened to me recently, and I'll tell you the phrase. It's kind of funny. The phrase was, Dumpster panda. I've never heard this before. Now, maybe you haven't either. You're going, <laughs> or you do know it. I never heard it. And so, because I'm getting old, I just said, what? Dumpster panda. That's really weird. Well, I'll tell you what it means. Raccoon. And now I get it. I was like, oh, yeah, that makes total sense, right? Because raccoons, they go in your trash, and they're, like, dirty. They don't look, like, clean and white and black like the other. Good, I got it. That's fantastic. Now, here's the context. Some people are scared of dumpster pandas because they're kind of humanish. They exhibit human-like traits, and that's really weird, unless you're watching Guardians of the Galaxy, right? So then it's cool all of a sudden, and they can talk. We accept that. But in normal life situations, you run into one of these things, they're weird. And contrary to popular belief, they do not have opposable thumbs. But they can manipulate their paws in such a way so that they can pick things up, and that's scary. Now, the person who introduced the phrase, and I'm not going to say the name, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, because we never do that at C3 Church. We'll give the person a different name, Joni Tonson. And so, you know, it just, just he, he's in a kind of line of work. I won't mention the job that he does, but it involves arresting people and taking them to jail. He also gets to carry a gun, which is kind of cool, but not always. Anyway, <laughs> he had an encounter with a dumpster panda, and he was scared of it. If you're not like Joni Tonson and you want to capture one and have it as a pet or bring it to church and scare this individual, you can capture them. And I heard there's like an old school method of doing this. What you do is you get a cage and you make the bars just narrow enough so that it can get its paw in there and you stake the cage to the ground and you put in like aluminum foil, foil balls in there. What it is said that they will do is they'll get their paw in there, grab the ball of aluminum foil, but it'll reshape the paw, making it bigger. And they can't get it back out. And here's the thing about dumpster pandas. They are so greedy that they will risk their freedom and even their life to hold on to just this shiny little aluminum foil ball. Amazing. So today, in the rest of the story, we're going to see a theme of greed, and it'll be attached to last week's theme. We've received this gift. Maybe we've accepted this gift of grace from God. Now, are we going to be greedy with it? We'll talk about that today. So we're in the rest of the story, 2 Kings. Last week, it was a Shunammite woman receiving this gift, at first rejecting it, then receiving it, then having faith to bring the boy back to life, which was amazing. Gehazi. We got a little preview into his character last week. We're going to look into that a little more this week. So there's an interesting thing that comes up today, Ben-Hadad. We were introduced to this guy in 1 Kings 15, so it's easy to kind of forget. 
We also enter a section, probably, probably the worst section as far as names are concerned. Names are already very confusing in the Bible, but here you'll have overlapping kings with the same exact names or coming in after it, was it this guy or that guy, and people get confused. But here's also what happens. There are a lot of these accounts where only one of the people in the account is actually named, and the rest, ah, the king of Aram, the king of Israel. And so your head's spinning when you're really trying to figure it all out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert the names for you here and there, try to make it a little bit easier. But Ben-Hadad isn't named in this first section of the text, and then he is. So you run into this whole thing, and my wife is going to shoot me a really evil look right now because we've had this conversation. It runs into probably, clearly, or certainly. Things like that fall into categories in the Bible, those three categories. So you can say, if someone isn't named, well, it's probably this person, or it's clearly this person, or it's certainly this person, if the person is named. Here we run into the probably clearly <laughs> section, because Ben-Hadad was mentioned as the king of Aram. We're going to see at the end of this section, he dies, but there's no other king of Aram in the middle. So it's pretty clear. Is it certain? He's not named, so I'm not sure. Right, so we're doing larger sections here. That's how we get the context and better applications. So 2 Kings 5.1, the king of Aram, clearly Ben-Hadad, had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But through, though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a mate. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go and see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying his gifts, 750 pounds of silver. That's 10 talents. Talent, I believe, is 75 pounds of silver. It's a lot. 150 pounds of gold and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. So... I'm going to summarize some of these accounts for you pretty quickly. So what ends up happening is the king of Israel, clearly Jehoram or Joram, if you see that in your Bible, it's interchangeable. So it's just a variant spelling, Jehoram, Joram. He's like, what? Am I God that I can heal this person of his leprosy? He tears his clothes. They do that when they're really angry. Don't do that here if you get angry with me. <laughs> so Elisha finds out. He says, send him to me. I'll show you that there's a real prophet here in Israel. So Naaman goes to him, goes to Elijah's house, and Elijah doesn't come out. He sends a messenger out and he says, look, he gives him a set of instructions. Go ahead and dip yourself in the river Jordan seven times. And he gets upset. Naaman's like, he should have come out to see me himself. And he gets mad and he kind of stomps away. And he starts talking about the rivers in Damascus being better anyway. I'll go back and just dip myself over there. But his officers go to him and they say, wait, 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 wait. Look, this was a really easy thing to do. Jordan's right there. Just go there and dip yourself in. If he had given you a hard thing to do, wouldn't you have done it? Yeah. Okay. So he goes down to the Jordan River, dips himself seven times in the water. And when he comes out, his skin is new, like a child's skin, it says. He's healed. So he goes back to Elisha and he offers him gifts. Says, Thank you so much. Elisha says, surely as the Lord lives, I won't accept your gifts. So Naaman says, all right, well, allow me to load up two mules full of the dirt from this area. <clears throat> and also, when I go with my master to worship in Rimen, just, you know, I'm going to lean on his armor. He's going to lean on my arm. Let me bow with him. Elisha says, go in peace. Okay. Then Gehazi, remember the guy with the staff, he couldn't heal the boy. He's like, wait a minute, you should have accepted those gifts. How do you let this Aramean guy go? So he catches up with him and he makes up a backstory. He says, my master told me to get you. We have two young prophets here from the land of Ephraim. We need 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing. Okay, I'll give you twice that. So Gehazi takes it, 
brings it back home and hides it. Elisha says, where were you? Nowhere. Don't you realize I was there with you in spirit? And then he describes what happened. And because you did this, you're going to get Gehazi's leprosy. And then when he left the house, he now has leprosy. Now, if you turn the page, it seems kind of weird, like this displaced little story. And so this is why you do larger sections of text, because it's not weird when you do it the right way. The story of the floating axe head. Pay attention to details. I've seen people teach and preach on this all by itself, and they're going to miss what you're going to get today, almost every time. So, and now someone's going to be like, I had a pastor who preached on that and did it exactly the way you did it. But anyway, I took a chance there. That's you know, what you do. So, so anyway, you turn the page and you get to this story and there's some prophets there. Elisha is back in the story. He's there. And they say, well, you know, the place we're worshiping at, it's too small. We got to make a bigger one. There's a lot of timber down by the Jordan River, logs, trees. We can cut them down, make a bigger place. Come with us, Elijah says, okay. Elisha says, okay. So then there's a prophet chopping the wood and the axe head flies off the handle, goes into the Jordan River sinks down. He freaks out. It was a borrowed axe. So he's going to be in trouble. Elisha says, where did it fall in? He shows him where it fell in. He gets a stick and he puts it in the water at that spot and the axe head floats up. Go grab it, Elisha says. Well, that's weird. And it just kind of goes immediately to another account that we'll see in a minute of Elisha trapping the Arameans. What's that all about? Think about it. Where did Naaman get healed? The Jordan River. Where did the axe head fall in? The Jordan River. These two accounts are a prefigure of baptism. Jesus got baptized. Where? The Jordan River. So as we are burdened with sin, we're heavy with sin, so is the axe head. Yet, even though we were really heavy with sin and burdened, we still come up in baptism and we rise as a new creation. That's the symbolism of baptism. Paul gives it the seed analogy. We die and then rise a new creation in Christ. Name it. Sick goes into the Jordan, comes up, new creation. It all goes together perfectly. So now you have an account of Elijah trapping the Arameans. And so now it's Ben-Hadad back in the account. Now it's, it's, it's very certain that it's him at this point. And he's upset because they're warring with Israel, yet everywhere his army goes, there's Israel. It seems like they know where they're going to be. Ben-Hadad gets really upset with his officers. He thinks one of them's a traitor. Like, who's the rat here? And who I got to kill? No, it's Elisha. He knows everything. The Lord tells him everything. He even knows what you say in your bedroom. He's like, well, let's get him. So he sends messengers out to find him. He's in a town called Dothan. So they send out the army. The Arameans are surrounding the city. There's a young man, it says, an assistant or servant to Elisha. He sees the army. What are we going to do? He's like, we have more on our side than they on theirs. Then he prays to the Lord and he says, open his eyes. So the Lord does and he sees chariots of fire on the hillside, like the chariot of fire that divided Elisha and Elijah when he got taken up. All goes together. Then he prays, blind the Arameans. The Lord does. There's a blind army out there. So Elisha goes out and he says, these aren't the droids you're looking for. No, <laughs> said they didn't have droids yet. So he says, no, 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 the guy you're looking for is in another place. Let me lead you. They can't see him, right? Bald guy, baldy, remember? So he leads them to Samaria. Samaria is the capital city. Then he says, open their eyes. They see that they're surrounded in this Samarian city. The king, probably Jehoram, Jehoram. <laughs> he says, should I kill them? Father, father. He's like a priest. Should I kill them? No. We don't kill prisoners, feed them and let them go back to their master. So that's exactly what happens. The king gives them a feast, sends them on their way. But here's the thing. It says there are no more raiding parties, but Ben-Hadad is a little greedy. 
2 Kings 6.24. Sometime later, however, King Ben-Hadad of Aram mustered his entire army and besieged Samaria. Not very grateful, is he? As a result, there was great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver and a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver before you go outside and collect dove's dung or the bird poop from the ducks. (laughs) Let me explain. You're not going to get that much money for it. (laughs) <laughs> the idea here is that like things that are normally worthless cost a lot of money because there's a great famine. And when you're starving to death, you'll eat a lot of things that you wouldn't normally eat, including <laughs> this. So Joram and Jehoram, he's walking along the wall of the city, and a woman calls out to him, help. He says, if the Lord couldn't help you, what can I do? What do you want? Here's the deal. (laughs) Another woman and I agreed to eat our children. We agreed to eat our children. We ate mine. It says I cooked my kid first. Ate him, boys. Now it's her turn, and she doesn't want to do it. Pause. (laughs) That's crazy. right? So we thought Game of Thrones was bad. (laughs) That's crazy. So it goes back to what I was saying last week. When we think about God, oh, he's so mean in the Old Testament. No, he's just and righteous. And again, read to the end. It's the same God. Jesus is going to come back with the justice. Right? So these are wicked, evil people doing unimaginable things. And so the king, as wicked and evil as he is, he tears his clothes. Again, that's what they do. Don't do it. And they notice he's wearing like sackcloth. That's something you put on when you mourn or you repent Right? So he's already in this state. Gets really, really angry and upset about it. But here's the thing. He blames Elisha. Well, may the Lord strike me and kill me if this very day Elisha doesn't lose his head. So go find him. 2 Kings 6, 32. Elisha was sitting in his house with the elders of Israel when the king sent a messenger to summon him. But before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, a murderer has sent a man to cut off my head. When he arrives, shut the door and keep him out. We will soon hear his master's steps following him. He'll be right behind him. While Elisha was still saying this, the messenger arrived. And the king said, all this misery is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now, this is a really good example of an awkward chapter break. There were not numbers in the originals. I've told you guys this before because you got to turn the page and it just continues. 2 Kings 7, 1. Elisha replied, listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver and 12 quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. But Elisha replied, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. Remember that. So here we get a story of gratitude and greed, gratitude versus greed. And this is where it's important to keep reading because otherwise that doesn't make any sense. Hold on to what you just heard. There are four lepers probably outside the town gate. It says at the entrance to the city or at the gate, probably outside the town. That's where you put the lepers. They would have to stay outside the camp. And they're like, you know what? We're going to starve to death anyway. So let's just surrender to the Arameans who are besieging Samaria. So all of this, the women eating their kids, this, what happens with Elijah, all under the context of being besieged, the city Samaria under siege. So let's just surrender. Okay, so they get to the Aramean camp, but there's just plunder everywhere. There's stuff everywhere, even like the donkeys and the horses are still tied up, the tents are still up. Great! So they begin to eat and drink. It says, eat wine, drink wine, eat, having a great time, stashing silver and gold and stuff. They're like, this is wonderful. But here's the interesting thing. These lowly lepers go, this isn't right. We have to share. <laughs> Something bad might happen to us if we don't. So they go back to the town, tell the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers let people know. The king wakes up in the middle of the night, and he thinks it's a trap. They're trying to get us to come out of the city. When they do, they're going to come in. 
He doesn't want to do it. He sends messengers. They come back. They verify the report. Yeah, it's true. So then all of a sudden, the people start trampling out, storming the place. Remember the officer that Elisha said, yeah, you'll see it, but you won't be able to eat any of it. Well, then Hadad says, hey, go do some traffic control. You got to manage the situation here. So he does. But the people trample him, fulfilling Elisha's privacy. So everything he said came true. The officer being trampled, and by this time tomorrow on the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost one piece of silver, and 12 quarts of barley grain will cost one piece of silver. So I made another chart. Not the drawing, right? We went through this before. If I knew how to draw, he'd have bigger biceps. So anyway, <laughs> almost the same colors today too. That's kind of cool. Can I replicate that? I might hurt myself anyway. Um, so <laughs> if you're not new here among us, you know about the parallel accounts. We're moving in parallel on, on some of these. This is where it gets very, very, very complicated because there's a lot of stuff in Second Kings, not in Second Chronicles. So that's basically what it looks like. It's in the app. Um, yeah, it's in the app. So we're only going to be doing about half-ish of this, a little more than half of this, but I want to acknowledge a couple things in these sections. In 2 Chronicles, it's not in 2 Kings. It's kind of a confusing type of account because what's going to happen is Elijah writes a letter to King Joram or Joram of Judah now, not of Israel, and you might be thinking, wait a minute, didn't he get taken up into heaven? Why did he come back into the story? Well, a lot of people speculate, and they'll say, well, it's kind of out of order, isn't it? And this, that, and the other thing, and they make a lot of excuses. You don't have to. <laughs> you just have to have an understanding of what happens in the Old Testament and then what happens in the New Testament, and it's kind of easy to follow once you understand it. Being in the series, you might understand it. Elijah was taken up. He did not die. Remember the transfiguration that I was talking about maybe a couple weeks ago? Well, who showed up? Elijah and Moses, and they're hanging out with Jesus, having a conversation. So why can't Elijah write a letter or dictate a letter from someone? Totally possible if we're believing this is true. So that's a great possibility, perhaps a letter from heaven. So if you read that and you're confused, that's there. Uh, we are not going to address that. What I want to do is we're going to stay in 2 Kings right now. We're only going to go about halfway through chapter 8 because here's what happens. Again, the chapter numbers can just throw you off sometimes, especially like we've discussed. Sermon on the Mount, 5, 6, 7, Matthew. It's one continuous stream. When you go chapter 5 and you close it, you're interrupting Jesus. You need to keep reading. You walked out of his sermon. So it kind of happens here. You'll see a theme of greed if you go from one end to another exactly like we are. So let's continue that focus, gratitude and greed. So if you remember the Shunammite woman, she will enter back into the account. 2 Kings 8, 1. Elisha had told the woman whose son he brought back to life, take your family and move to some other place. For the Lord has called for a famine on Israel that will last seven years. So the woman did as the man of God instructed. She took her family and settled in the land of the Philistines for seven years. So here's what happens. We get a scene where Gehazi is back in it, and he's with the king. And the king is asking him about Elisha. He knows he hung out with him. He's like, tell me some of the things he did. And Gehazi is telling him about this woman. Pause button. A lot of people, again, with this account, you got to watch what you listen to on the internet. They make up all kinds of excuses. Well, why was Gehazi there? Well, this happened before the leprosy. You're not paying attention if you're speculating like that. Remember Naaman? He was, what, a commander of the Aramean army, right? He was hanging out with Ben-Hadad. They had a conversation. He had leprosy. So kings do, on occasion, talk to lepers. It happens. So Gehazi could have leprosy here. So he's telling him stories, maybe at a distance, right? Wear a couple masks. I don't know. Whatever works for you. And as he's telling him the story... Sure enough, the Shunammite woman walks in with the boy. Gehazi stops. There they are, the one I'm telling the story about right now. The king asks the woman, really? She tells him the story, and then all of her property is restored, right? You leave a place for seven years, 
You might lose it. Plus, all of the product that she would have lost by not doing it, the proceeds from that, gets it all back. So that's a story of gratitude and obedience. But it goes to the next one. 2 Kings 8, 7. Elisha went to Damascus, the capital of Aram, where King Ben-Hadad lay sick. When someone told the king that the man of God had come, the king said to Haziel, take a gift to the man of God. Then tell him to ask the Lord, will I recover from this illness? So Haziel loaded down 40 camels with the finest products of Damascus as a gift for Elisha. He went to him and said, your servant Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, has sent me to ask, will I recover from this illness? And Elisha replied, go and tell him, you won't surely recover. But actually, the Lord has shown me that he'll surely die. Elisha stared at Haziel with a fixed gaze until he became un uneasy. Then the man of God started weeping. Elisha started weeping. What's the matter? Haziel asked him. I know the terrible things that you're going to do to Israel. You're going to burn down their fortified towns, kill their young men, dash their babies, rip open their pregnant women. Haziel says, how could a nobody like me ever do such great things? Evil people. Elisha answered, the Lord has shown me that you're going to be the king of Aram. So Haziel goes back to King Ben-Hadad, and he says, yeah, you'll recover. That's what he said. But then the next day, he gets a wet blanket, puts it over Ben-Hadad's face, and kills him, becoming the next king of Aram. Greed. So today we see a theme of greed woven throughout the accounts of the kings. We also saw that people who were living humble lives or who had been humbled tended to be the ones that displayed more gratitude, right? Who were generous with their things. From the servant girl to the lepers, even Naaman, who was a general, but he had leprosy. He was very generous. He actually gave Gehazi twice as much stuff. He had been humbled. He knew what it was like to be with nothing and, and therefore less greedy, more generous, or to have this leprosy. When we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus, even though he was the Son of God, came as a humble, suffering servant, lived a humble life, and he was very generous, even under temptation. So if we're reading... Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, we see just before it, Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, right? We talked about that. Then after that, chapter 4, chapter 4, we see that Jesus is immediately impelled into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Forty days to be tempted by Satan. He's tempted by the devil. It says he's hungry. I bet. And so the devil uses that one first, uses the weakness that is clear. So if you're the son of God, turn that stone into bread. Oh, man doesn't live off of bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God, it says in Matthew, Luke, every word of God passes the test. Now think about it. He's in the wilderness, it says. When we're dealing with that region of the world, it's not like the wilderness like we think of it with pine trees and maybe dumpster pandas, right? Nothing like that. Nothing to eat. It's like a desert. It's horrible, real scary, awful place. First temptation passes the test. And in Luke, we'll go with Luke chapter 4. So he takes him up to a high place. He takes him up and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world at once. He says, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give all of this to you. No. We worship the Lord God only. That's it. Passes the test. Then he whisks him up to the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point on the temple, and he says, if you're the son of God, jump off. You won't even dash your foot on a stone, Psalm 91. No. You don't put the Lord God to the test. So we see that Jesus is completely selfless. He's above temptation. He's above greed. If we look at Philippians, we did a whole series on it. I love Philippians. It's like a theological thank you note. What 
a beautiful letter from Paul to the church in Philippi. And he's thanking them for this gift that they had given. He's in prison, right? So he's very humble. He's in prison, still with joy in Jesus, very grateful. He's in Philippi. Thanks for sending Epaphroditus with the gift, guys, and keep it up. Continue being generous. Be like Epaphroditus, who almost died getting me that gift and then getting the letter back to you. Be like Timothy. No one else like him. He's great. Why? Because they're all being like Jesus. And kind of at the center-ish of the letter, you have a really beautiful poem, the Carmen Christi. It's totally beautiful. It's about Jesus. So everything radiates out of this beautiful theological poem. Wonderful, wonderful letter. It's a letter of gratitude. And it says this just before this poem. Philippians 2, 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Who, existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be taken advantage of. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For that reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that every knee will bend. Those who are in heaven and on earth and below the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Beautiful. Amazing. He's selfless to the point of death on a cross. That's our king. Ephesians 5.1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. When we get to passages like this, I believe that some people like to focus on one particular sin over another and perhaps deflect what they're guilty of. But if we can get that back up on the screen again, if it's all in one shot, did you notice how many times it says greed? Three. What about the sexual immorality, right? That's what a lot of Christians like to pick on, especially when it says homosexuality. Not that it's a good thing. That one. <laughs> right? We're going to pick it against that one. That's what we're going to choose to do right, this weekend. But is the picketer greedy? So if Paul says it three times, which one's worse if we're going to make a worse or better? I'd say the greed. Idolater, worshiping the things of the world. Amazing. People are really incredible, aren't they? And to make one worse, don't look at me, look at that other person over there. Now, some of you may be convicted by this. I get convicted by this. Hi, my name's Gene. I tend to be greedy. <laughs> Trying to fix it with God's help. And here's the thing. A lot of people, especially nowadays, are hoarding a lot of stuff out of fear. Maybe they're waiting for the siege to come. Fear. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. What the world has convinced us of. <laughs> and so out of fear, I see people hoarding stuff, holding back just in case. 
That's not what the Word of God says we should be doing. We should be living in faith. Generosity doesn't stop because we're convinced that there's something crazy going on in the world. Did you, did you see the thing about eating the kids? <laughs> it's always been crazy. But Jesus doesn't say, you know, it's crazy right now. Just hold back some stuff. And I'm not talking about saving for like a home improvement project or something Respond, I do that. But actually within the midst of that, I can share with you a miracle. <laughs> when it all comes to fruition and I got the whole story, I'm going to share it. Because I was saving for a project and God looks like he's going to just fix it free. Amazing. Amazing. So I'm not talking about being responsible or saving for your kid's college, whatever it is, saving up to buy a car so you don't have a payment. Fine. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fear hoarding. So maybe that's convicting. Others, maybe like the lepers, maybe you're sharing it. Maybe you've come from humble experiences and circumstances, and so you're just trying to be as generous as possible. Maybe you're saying, that's not me. Maybe you're saying, I tithe even. Maybe. Maybe you're like the Pharisee in Luke 18. Look it up. <laughs> so maybe you're like Jesus, right? You're completely selfless. That's great. Free from all temptation and excess. But let's keep reading. If we keep reading in Luke 4, let's take a look here at how all this comes full circle. Luke 4. I'll give Lonnie a minute. <laughs> Luke chapter 4. So remember, the temptations of Jesus. Immediately following that, Jesus is in his own hometown. They don't accept him here. The prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. He's handed the Isaiah scroll. He's going to read some scripture. He's going to get up and read scripture for everyone in church or the synagogue. Isaiah 61, but it's right here in Luke. Luke 14, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Really interesting. It is Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, but it's the Greek version, not the Hebrew version. But Jesus says, this scripture has been fulfilled. Right now. Like, how can this be? Isn't this Joseph's son? Like, he's a local kid. What? It's crazy. So Jesus says, Luke 4, 23, Then he said, You will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your own hometown, like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly, there, will be many needy widow, there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a Gentile, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. Here it is. But the only one healed was Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of a hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but Jesus passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Ooh, it all came together there, didn't it? Amazing. When you have the whole thing in mind, God's word's incredible. I get excited about it, and I'm not going to apologize for that. So here's the point. Greed. How? The Jewish people were being greedy with God. Any time, from Jesus all the way to Paul and Acts, when they start talking about salvation to the Jewish people, going to the Gentiles, they go nuts. That's when they want to kill him. That's when they want to push Jesus over. That's when they want to stone Paul. Gentiles can't have God, even though prophets say so. That's what Jesus says. Yeah, they can. You see, unlike Elijah, who served the widow at Zarephath, the Gentile woman, right? unlike the servant girl who led Naaman, think about it, to salvation. He then worships God. Now I know there's no God except in Israel. Sorry if I left that out. 
he comes to God. He brings him to salvation. Now, you may have said, I'm not greedy. Pastor Gene, you're wrong. How might we be hoarding that gift we talked about last week? We talked about receiving and accepting this gift of grace from God that we are saved by. How many went, cool, I'm set. It's convicting. Shouldn't we be sharing it? This is the worst day to ask this question, so forgive me. It's in the sermon notes, and I didn't think of this, but... <laughs> When's the last time you brought someone to church? I, you would not do that on daylight. Spring forward. Hey, come to me with, to church with me. That's a great way to aggravate someone, right? <laughs> it's early. You see, here's the thing. There's nothing new under the sun. I can promise you that. And if you read your Bible, God's telling you that. In these accounts, he's telling you that. If there's one thing that's clear, it has always been crazy. Correct? Right? Especially in this country, we kind of have it easy. Nobody's needing to eat their children. Okay, you know, like one person in some remote place in Nebraska or something. If you're from Nebraska, I'm sorry, I just picked a place. But anyway, right, it's not happening a lot. I don't hear about that a lot. And if it is, it's like never. This comes up a lot. Cannibalism? <laughs> a lot. You'd be amazed. Start reading it. You're going to read it a lot. It's not funny, but it's crazy. They do it a lot. It's always been crazy. But here's the difference now. This is what I think. This is my observation. Never at any time have we had all the craziness right there in the palm of our, own, our hands, right? I don't remember that. As a kid, not that old, but as a kid in the 80s, right? You got to tune out in the news. It only comes on a certain time, right? And at nighttime it goes off, right? They do the American anthem or something. It's like, you know, with all the color lines, and that's it. So you can't just like go like binge watch the news in the middle of the night. They probably had it right. Go to bed, <laughs> right? Was it like the Star Spangled Banner they play at night and that's it? Go to bed, go to bed, <laughs> right? We'd be waiting Saturday morning watching the color thing like, come on, come on. And then the cartoons would come on and you'd watch cartoons. Nobody watched the news on Saturday morning. Are you crazy? Why would you watch the news on Saturday morning? Why would you want to aggravate yourself that much? Wow. Nope. All the time. We've got all our sins in there, don't we? Including the news. They're all in there. People are totally addicted to it. That's new. That's new. I've never seen that before. So for Christians, what are we thinking, right? We've got to get our stuff straight. We do. We have to just turn it off. Turn it off. Get one of those things, boom, put it on the thing, and make it do that all night. I don't know. Turn it off. Turn it off on Saturdays. Turn it off. Right? Then once we develop a good discipline, we need to start encouraging others. And here's the thing. It's the fear mongering. The fear mongering. We should fear the Lord. Yes, been through this. But not any of this other stuff. We should be out there offering an alternative. We've got one here. So the world, fear, anger, right? Fear, anger, everything's angry. Eh, divide, get you nuts about everything, all riled up. Gosh, this is what they're feeding you. There's worse things in other places in the world. This is what they're feeding you to get you all riled up. But we have an alternative. So we should be saying, calm down. I got a place you can come with me. It'll be Sunday morning. You're going to meet a lot of people who are filled with joy because they know Jesus. Don't worry about that stuff. Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to take care of all of this. That's it. It's joy. We preach the opposite message, anger and fear. Over here, that's fruit of the flesh. It's not of God. It says it. Read Galatians again. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. That's us. There's the alternative. Come with me 
if you want to live, right? So, seriously, though, like literally, come with me. Experience joy. Experience Jesus. That's what we have here. Consistency, hope. So if we have gratitude for the grace of God, we should be generous with it. That's what we're here to do. Worship him. And then bring more people into the fold. Share this life of joy. So consider it. Let's go out this week and be vessels of joy and hope and peace and all the things that Christians are supposed to be. Leave the justice to Jesus. He'll take care of it. And that should be a calming thing for us, right? He's got it. It's okay. Remember, read the Old Testament. It's always been crazy. Calm down. So bring more people in and share it. We need to share our message with people. The word, not the world. Amen? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone who inconvenienced themselves to, so greatly to come here today. And we pray for those who did not. And we know there are other circumstances. People are going through things. There are people who are ill, and we pray for their illnesses. We pray that they get better. There are people who are living in fear, and we pray for them too, to really come to know Jesus, to come into a full understanding. Maybe they need to surrender to really receive your Holy Spirit so they can have peace, love, joy, patience, that self-control that only you, only you, Lord, can bring. I pray for everyone watching online. They'll be motivated to come back into the unity of the Holy Spirit, into the body, instead of a substitute. But until then, we're with them, we love them, we're being patient with them. Most of all, Lord, I just pray that you make us vehicles of your Holy Spirit, of your love, of your patience, of your kindness, and we just radiate that out. Let us be generous with all the fruit you have provided us with. I ask these things in Jesus' name.